It's one of the biggest fails in business history, Quibi. You may think you know the story. Business royalty raised almost $2 billion to start the latest and greatest streaming platform, and it falls on its face in record time, only seven months from launch to shutdown. But contrary to popular belief, Quibi was not a bad idea. In fact, it was pretty ahead of its time, even if it was a huge marketing disaster. I'm Jen Kleinhens, and this is Choice Hacking. Today, I'm breaking down some of the sneaky psychological traps that the Quibi team fell into, and you could too. In 2018, the world of streaming content was a war zone. Big players like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon were spending billions of dollars creating original content, locked in a cutthroat race for the eyes and wallets of the American public. Quibi entered what was one of the most contentious and competitive markets on Earth, and they knew that they'd need to be armed with big pockets. So they raised a ton of money, $1.75 billion to be exact. That might sound like a lot to you and me, but in the world of streaming, where companies like Amazon and Netflix spend tens of billions of dollars every year on content, it was a drop in the bucket. But Quibi's founding team were optimistic. They were, after all, entertainment and business royalty. Co-founder Meg Whitman was the ex-CEO of Hewlett Packard Computers and eBay and a true expert in growing technology brands. To say that the other co-founder, Jeffrey Katzenberg, was well-connected would maybe be the understatement of the century. He was the chairman of the Walt Disney Company for 10 years, co-founder and CEO of DreamWorks Animation. Yeah, the guys that made Shrek. Oh, and let's not forget he's the K in the SKG that appears below the DreamWorks logo. To the late person, Quibi seemed set up for success. They had a great team and lots of money. But that was the problem. Quibi fell victim to a cognitive bias or an error in thinking called the halo effect. The halo effect describes how one positive trait of a person can affect our judgments of the rest of their personality, performance, and potential. Whitman and Katzenberg were some of the most successful business people in the world, and Quibi's investors included Disney, NBC Universal, Sony, AT&T, and banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And when people and institutions of that caliber are involved in a startup, it gives a bit of shine to the project at hand. That kind of history makes people feel like it can't go wrong. But in the real world, being successful in the past doesn't necessarily dictate how successful you'll be in the future. The Quibi target customer was the busy daily commuter who up until that point was forced to watch their favorite streaming shows a few minutes at a time, on the subway, on a bus, or on their lunch break. So Quibi had a great idea. Studio quality shows with episodes that were only five to 10 minutes long, so people could watch an entire episode while they waited in line for their morning Starbucks. Quibi was one of the first short form video platforms, like TikTok and Vine before it, Quibi wanted to get the world hooked on bite-sized content that they could watch on their phones. In fact, the name Quibi is short for Quick Bites. And on the surface, this approach made total sense. In 2018, people were spending more than three hours a day on their phones, and platforms like Instagram and Snapchat were driving billions of views a day on short-form content. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Jeffrey Katzenberg told a reporter, what you're doing today, if you're in our core demographic, is you're actually watching 60 to 70 minutes of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. That growth is now a well-established customer habit that Quibi is sailing into. But there was a big problem with this strategy. Quibi was only looking at data about how people behaved without thinking if their product gave people something they couldn't get anywhere else. In their minds, the answer was yes, because Katzenberg and Whitman fell for a cognitive bias known as the false consensus effect. This describes people's tendency to think that our own beliefs, behaviors, and thoughts are more common in the general population than they actually are. In other words, we think other people like what we like and do what we do. If we eat at McDonald's once a week, we assume that most other folks eat there just as often. If we fly first class, we think most other people have probably done that at some point in their lives too. And if we think 10-minute episodic mobile shows are amazing, we think other people will love them too, even if in real life, customers just didn't see the point. Quibi created two problems for themselves. First, they painted themselves into a corner with their insistence on short-form content. 
There wasn't any existing studio quality short form episodic content, so Quibi had to create everything on the platform from scratch. Even though established players like Netflix spent billions every year on original content, they still got a lot of their views from older long form shows like The Office. No, God, please, no, no! But Quibi couldn't pad out its content with existing shows. So it faced a huge, expensive uphill battle to get enough content on its platform to get customers interested. The second way Quibi cursed themselves was by ignoring the social side of streaming. You see, the Quibi app didn't let customers grab screenshots, which meant these new shows couldn't gain traction in wider pop culture because people couldn't make reaction gifs and memes or create any buzz for these short form shows. Quibi was so afraid that people would steal their content, they turned a blind eye to how social media could help create a streaming hit. And streaming platforms live or die on their original programming. Disney Plus got popular after The Mandalorian became a hit, Hulu took off after The Handmaid's Tale, and Netflix conquered streaming with House of Cards. But Quibi didn't have a hit show that made the platform a must-subscribe, so there was no real way to drive demand. Marketing isn't just the ads that a company runs. Marketing is actually four different things. Product, promotions, placement, and price. And Quibi failed all four. Now, we've already covered product, but what about the rest? Well, placement is about where your product's available to buy and use. And Quibi was only available on people's phones. There was no TV app and customers hated that. This strategy also put Quibi in direct competition with free short form platforms like Snapchat and Instagram. By the time a TV app finally launched, the damage had already been done. Next is promotions. Quibi spent millions on high budget premium advertising, including a Super Bowl ad featuring Chance the Rapper. But because these ads didn't answer the simple question, okay, so what can I watch on Quibi? It didn't matter how many Super Bowl ads they bought, customers just didn't get it. As for the price, Quibi only offered a free plan for the first 90 days post-launch. So after that, no one could try it without paying. And then it cost $8 to watch shows without ads, which just didn't seem worth it to most people. Now we talked about the psychology behind why Quibi failed, but I want to mention one last cognitive bias. It's something called overconfidence, which describes people's tendency to be a little too optimistic about their chances of success. Whitman and Katzenberg felt like they couldn't lose because they'd been so successful up until that point. So they did things that overconfident people do. They spent way too much money on ads and content without figuring out if people even wanted their product in the first place. 